Barbara Dermot Manahan is in Blackpool for this week's big story to find out who could be classed as troublemakers for Labour leader Tony Blair. Top businessmen forging new links with Labour. The Tory press being fair to Blair. And a socialist miner who feels utterly rejected. I'm Dermot Murnaghan. This week's big story, who's in and who's out in the new Labour Party. Hello, at the end of a dramatic week for the new Labour leader, Tony Blair. He began by basking in the admiration of the Tory press, who called him a man of action, a statesman, even a prime minister in waiting. And his left-wing opponents in the party were dismissed as dinosaurs with no future. Well, today, after their victory in the Clause 4 vote, those so-called dinosaurs have proved there's plenty of life in them yet. And Tony Blair's admirers in the Tory press are talking about blood on the floor. We spent the week in Blackpool watching the birth pangs of the new Labour Party and how its leader is trying to win new friends at the risk of losing old ones. You in the business sector, sir? Yes, we are, yes. Tuesday morning, Labour's rolling out the red carpet for business. A select group of industrialists arrive for an unusual day out at the Labour conference. The price is £350 for rubbing shoulders and breaking bread with Labour's leaders. Some big corporate names have come. Hello. 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 The breakfast is held behind closed doors. At first, both sides are shy of being filmed together, but some warm up as the day goes on. Excuse me, can I ask you about the breakfast? How did it go? Very good indeed. Yes, yes, also excellent. lovely. Thank, thank you. About... Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me about the breakfast? Well, it was uh, very pleasant. Uh, it was useful. What? Why did you come? Um, I wanted to know more about what the Labour Party was doing, how, what its thoughts were as to how the UK would move forward uh, if it got to power. Rick Sumner, former miner and disillusioned Labour member, braves the conference lobby to invite the Labour faithful to the miners' fringe meeting on Wednesday night. He finds three shadow cabinet ministers. George, could we ask you if you come into the minor fringe meeting tomorrow? I, I don't think I'll be able to come because I'm absolutely jam packed, but I'll, I'll send them out. 7.30, it's the lads who are still sat for me. Yeah, four. Yeah. Can I invite you to our fringe meeting tomorrow night? All right, can I just take the leaflet? All right, it's nice to meet you. Robbie, Robbie. You remember we came to Walworth Road earlier this year and you came down to talk to us about the victimised miners? Yes, I do. I do. Yes, I do. Is this something you want to give up? Well, it's our fringe meeting tomorrow night, and it uh, would uh -huh. be nice if you could come along. I'm addressing uh, the LCR rally there. I've got two meetings tomorrow night, so I won't be there, but I do remember meeting with you. For ten years, Rick has been selling mining memorabilia at his stall in aid of redundant miners. The one place he never thought he'd feel redundant was at the Labour Party conference. I'd really come to the end of the line. I got my membership card, I cut it up, I gave it to the girl on the Labour Party recruiting desk. It, I didn't feel it's my party anymore. Rick considers himself part of Labour's most traditional constituency, the working class miner. I'd like to ask Tony Blair, and whatever happened to socialism, they seem to have completely lost sight of that. And increasingly, the people who are the backbone of the party are becoming more and more alienated. Professor Ivor Crewe is one of Britain's top experts on our political parties. On his way to study the changing scene in Blackpool, we asked him about the miners. The National Union of Miners has been at the very core of the Labour Party, but I think the position has changed. The truth of the matter is that if the NUM, certainly if Arthur Scargill, comes out in militant opposition to what Blair stands for, Blair will be delighted. It'll serve him very well. What he wants to do is to persuade the public that the Labour Party is making a decisive break from traditional old Labour attitudes, and to the extent that the NUM or other traditional unions say that they're unhappy with the direction in which Le Le uh, Blair is leading the Labour Party, Blair will be pleased. Have a look at that. Well, the more customary foes of the Labour Party are the Tory press. They claim they're giving Blair a fair chance. Bury the bogeyman. 
The jury's still out on Tony Blair, of course. He may have an Achilles heel, it may be tax, it may be the minimum wage. There's also the suspicion about uh, Tony Blair that he's the master of the sound bite and it's all sound and no bite. I think we need to see the beef and uh, perhaps between now and the end of the week we'll see what uh, Mr Blair is made of and uh, what the Labour Party's made of. The party's certainly making its overtures to big business and the feeling's mutual. An unprecedented number of companies have taken stalls here. One high street name's delighted with one of its Labour customers. Well, Mrs Blair came on the stand yesterday and said that she does occasionally use one of our stores, which is great. Into this bright world of big business stroll two traditional Labour comrades also feeling rejected. Paul Novak, who earns £3 an hour as an office worker, and Alf Goldberg are campaigning against low pay. They want less interest in bosses and more commitment to a firm minimum wage. I don't think it would divide the party to come down and say that the minimum wage should be £4 an hour. I don't see that at all. The Clifton Hotel lunch venue for the businessmen. They're getting to meet some of Labour's more famous supporters, like film producer David Putnam. Today he's there to court big fish like the chairman of the British Airports Authority, Sir John Egan. How persuasive do you find the Labour Party? I think it's very useful that they've had such a, a meeting for us and uh, I think um, the dialogue has started, I hope, between business and the Labour Party. Most surprisingly of all, the British Bankers Association are visiting. Only a few weeks ago, Shadow Chancellor Gordon Brown and Treasury spokesman Alistair Darling lambasted them for imposing excessive bank charges while they were also making huge profits. But today, it smiles all round. Well, Alistair Darling's views this evening, I think, were quite interesting. He spoke, I thought, with a certain amount of moderation. Perhaps that's because he had a lot of bankers in the audience. I don't know. The object is not to get them all to wear red rosettes at the next election. The object is to have an exchange of views. And I think part of the problems that have bedeviled Britain is that for many, many years, uh, the leaders of business only spoke to the Conservative Party and we didn't speak to them at all. They seem to have a very realistic approach, I think, about some of uh, the, the, the problems, the difficulties there are for, for banks, for customers, for the economy generally and uh, a very pragmatic approach. At the Winter Gardens, the media await the big speech, the Tory press with special interest. We think he's a sincere man. Uh, we don't yet uh, have too many sticks of which to beat him. The media speculate on the content of Blair's speech as delegates and the press jostle for the best view in the House. Now, I understand people have got to do the job, but we're here to see this speech as well, and we'd like to see it. We've all had a, a snippet to get it fed to us. Most of them are different, so that no one has got a full picture of what the speech is going to contain. As Tony Blair takes centre stage, all around the conference building, his new friends are expectant. David, conference friends. Today I set out my vision for our party and our country. In the press gallery, the Daily Express's John Craig is looking for any chance to score points. Here we are, look, stealing the Tories' clothes. Law and order, family values. I say it is time to take these Tories apart for what they have done. But how high will taxes be? Would Blair sign the EC's social chapter? Questions being asked by the new business friends up in the dress circle. And without a seat in the hall, Rick Sumner mulls over souvenirs of a time when workers like him had the ear of the Labour leadership. Many, many years ago, when my daughter was in kiddie, she was playing with a wireless, and she turned onto a foreign programme and she listened to it for a while and she said, Dad, there's a man talking without saying anything. And I just thought of that then, listening to Tony Black. We are not going to win despite our beliefs. We will only win because of our beliefs. So has Blair's gala debut converted the industrialists? I think it's very competent. Yeah. A very good start, yes. It needs time for us to <coughs> understand precisely what's inside that, but also a sensible start. Again, one step at a time. But 
That speech is certainly worth taking note of. It was a great speech. I think it's probably hit all the right buttons. I think it's going to send a wave of uh, nerves through the Tory party who have been watching it. He's uh, very subtly decided to get rid of uh, Clause 4, the state ownership. He's talked about trust, responsibility, tearing up all the old shibboleths of the Labour Party. And he's uh, taken an enormous risk and it's clearly paid off. Is it going to pay off with your headlines tomorrow? Will I think it hope? will. I think we're giving a good, a good treatment. What he declared today was war on the constitution of the party and a commitment to ditch Clause 4. Oh, great straight off that last quote. Back in the press room, the journalists immediately get stuck into the problem of how to present there in tomorrow's editions. Is John with you or has he gone in to see Mary? Richard Stott, editor of Today, immediately rings London with his plans for the front page. It involves Arthur Scargill. Right out. He's going to portray the miners' leader as a dinosaur because Scargill spoke out against Blair's new ideas. They're supposed to, they're supposed to not breed, but they do. That's what I keep doing. Meanwhile, Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair's new press officer, is briefing journalists from rival papers, giving them the right spin on that all-important speech. Campbell also happens to be one of the Today newspaper's top columnists. Come on, just get on with this. He's soon helping the editor. No apparent conflict of interest here for one of Blair's most influential aides. Unfortunately for both Today and Blair, the final headline was to prove premature. Other journalists insist they don't swallow the spin doctor's line. I've come to a point of view about this party without any help from their spin doctors. Uh, the fact is, if the press are being nicer about them, it's because the press is broadly speaking an organ of Tory opinion. It's broadly speaking a bit annoyed with the present Tory government and it's finding it very difficult to pick holes at the moment in what Mr Blair is doing. He hit a lot of those good buzz issues, didn't he? Mm. Uh, the Lord Daily Lord Express Lord team Lord dissect Lord Blair's Lord speech Lord word by Lord word, Lord pulling out those Lord policy Lord switches Lord which will anger the Labour left. All good buzz issues. I would have yeah. thought that your news story for the front is the last bit of the speech, isn't it? Yeah. New Labour, New Britain. Mm. Yeah. You know, kind of he's... But, isn't, but, isn't perhaps but be careful, he's not ripping up the Constitution. He's just issuing a statement, a further statement, isn't he? So how's the speech going down among other new friends? Did you see Blair's speech this afternoon? Yes, yes we did. Yes. Can you tell me about it and what uh, you thought about it? It was extremely interesting, extremely well delivered, very impressive speech, lots of interesting ideas in it. And we enjoyed it. Yes. The bit that disappointed me most was that Tony didn't fix a, a, a minimum wage, a figure for the minimum wage. I think there's something that's been bubbling under confidence all week. And that's a constant dilemma for the leadership. To set a minimum wage now would open them to charges of financial irresponsibility. But how can they reassure the unhappy brothers? They almost look to you in the leadership and say, he's a man who knows about work. He's from the working classes. I mean, what can you say to reassure them? Well, first of all, I was minimum wage. I was a commie chef, and that's a trainee chef, in case that's wrongly interpreted, inside a kitchen of a hotel where my pay was two pound, and it was guaranteed by the Wage Council Act. They have stripped all that protection away from them. Two and a half million people now, with no protection in those low-paid industries. So I have no doubt I want to see this party committed to minimum wage. We are committed to it. So I ask them to have faith in that we are to do it, but I ask them to do something else. Come out and fight for the justification of minimum wage instead of making it more difficult and criticising us when we're committed to it. Blair never put it in his manifesto. Defend Clause 4. But the huge bone of contention was Clause 4. Immediately on the streets, the hard left were in action. Clause 4 is about redistributing wealth. It's securing for workers the full fruits of their industry. That's, that's the basis of the Labour Party constitution. Tony Blair apparently wants to change this and go in favour of a market economy instead. We followed supporters of the campaign group back to their Blackpool headquarters. Attention, please, comrades. We need to start this meeting and we need to get on with Here, the plans are being made to be. save the party Therefore, from its leader. I'd be grateful if comrades can keep their comments to a minimum, but I would also be pleased to hear a feeling, particularly from delegates and supporters today, as to how things have gone and what their sense is of the direction the bulletin should take for tomorrow. I think so far we got it about right. Certainly people around me in conference, were, there were gasps of amazement 
at Blair's speech, at the sections when he started talking about new constitution, people were sitting down, turning around to each other and saying, I don't believe he said that. I cannot believe that he's tearing apart the Labour Party. This question of Clause 4, could you remain, would you be comfortable in a Labour Party that doesn't have that on your membership card? It's I'm, been with you since you joined. It's, to me, it doesn't really it, matter what is on my... Um, membership card, it's what the party stands for and it's not just that particular principle, but I do believe public ownership is an important part of the philo philosophical belief I have and it distinguishes myself as a socialist from the Tories. By Tuesday evening after his triumphant speech, the Blair crush is on. Everybody wants a share of him, especially here at Geordie Night. The leader himself represents the North East. There's a media scrum too. Uh, what he says here is private, okay? You, everybody has to turn their cameras off when he's speaking because this is a private event. But like the waiting Geordies, we're all desperate too for more of Mr Blair. You've always been allowed to film Geordie Knight in the last four years. Not, yeah, not, 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 not when the leader speaks. You never have done. Yes, we have. No, I've, I've been working in this... I've covered the, the last, last four years of Joy Night, no. and we've always covered the leader's speech of Joy Night. No, the leader doesn't, no, it doesn't normally say anything at Joy Night. It just comes and has to sit down and then goes out again. I've always been allowed to film the entire thing. Well, you, you can't film him speaking. I'm sorry. I'm happy with it's that. It's doing well for BBC North this time. We haven't been allowed no, to film no. them doing anything. Well, that's not my fault. Region. But Mr Blair's media minders eventually relax and we're allowed to film the celebrations. Though Rick Sumner's not joining in. It's great to be here. It's really great to be here. Many, many thanks indeed for inviting me. Well, I don't suppose I need an invitation, do I? Because this is my night as well as yours. And I feel so proud. A ticket? <laughs> no, you know what? I had to sign in at the door, Mike. <laughs> Afterwards, Rick Sumner fights his way through the journalists and admirers to try to get a word in edgeways. It's not a good arena to press complaints about the lot of miners. At the Imperial Hotel, it's dinner time for the businessmen. Yes, it'll be an interesting evening. Yeah. What do you hope to get out of it? Oh, just part of a development of a long-term relationship with uh, the Labour Party. Hello. Are we going to the business, business, business dinner? dinner? Are we? Business dinner. Yes. 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 New business We're dinner. one of the uh, sponsors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not the Imperial, though. <laughs> but some Labour Party members are not to be found having dinner at the Imperial Hotel. Paul and Alf, the minimum wage campaigners, don't like their leaders hobnobbing with rich capitalists. It's just meeting people who are members of the Labour Party. We're having dinner. Nothing wrong with that, is it? You are quite comfortable now, virtually cozying up to, to captains of industry. We're not cozying up to them at all. We're having an exchange of views. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's completely open. If anyone wants to uh, know who's there, as far as I know, there's no reason for uh, not finding out. Uh, it's something that goes on not just at conferences, uh, but the whole time. There's no difficulty with it at all. It's an exchange of views. Nothing wrong with that. Well, I think it's very hard for Tony Blair, or for the, the vast majority of the rest of the shadow cabinet, to understand and to sympathise when they were holding a £350 a head dinner for business people. Now, that to me is totally divorced from the reality of people in my situation. For Tony Blair arriving for dinner with the businessmen, new friends and new labour are bound to conflict with the more traditional comrades. Isn't there a danger you discard the old or the old desert you? Um, they're not particularly important anymore. But the new don't come on board. The small businesses, the large businesses, they, they, they don't want to know. There's a gamble there, isn't there? 
I don't think we're courting new business to get votes. We hope they might vote for us because it's in their interest. After all, many, many of them have gone to the wall under the Tories, big and small businesses. We need to understand their requirements. They do generate a lot of work. And if we put employment at the top of the list, I'm bound to say wherever it may come from, it's important. It may be the local authorities. It may be small businesses. It may be all sorts of things. But we give a commitment to put full employment at the top of the list. In some cases, I would hope you could replace miners by miners by putting them back in pits. In other cases, it may be there are other people that want to work in small businesses. I'll look anywhere for jobs, and I think I'm expected to do that, and that's what I have to prove to the electorate that I know how to get people back to work. Yesterday morning, after Tony Blair's speech, Rick Sumner is coming to terms with just how far removed he feels from the new leader's style. Well, Rick, tell me about um, your encounter with Mr Blair when he turned up at that miners' do. Well, the thing that really upset me was, was the sort of minders who were very pushy and very stroppy. I, I wanted to ask him a simple question. I wanted to ask him about the commitment to the miners who were sacked in 84, who have never worked since, whose pensions have been destroyed. And uh, I, I mean, from Tony Blair, I got a big smile, a big handshake and a nod, and nothing else. I think the Labour Party doesn't want to be involved with people with dirty hands anymore. I think they'd like everyone to work on computers or sell insurance or hot dogs or something. So is it a good risk for Mr Blair to allow some old comrades to feel neglected and fall by the wayside? I think that there is a traditional left-wing working-class constituency that will certainly not relish the new direction of the Labour Party. The issue is whether they will stay at home at the next election and not vote and not go out to help the Labour Party if they're active members, or whether in the end they will come out and vote for the Labour Party. My guess is that the great majority of them will vote for the Labour Party because they've nowhere else to go. <laughs> A breakfast skim through of the dailies. After the enthusiastic reaction of the press yesterday for Blair's speech, there's a shock in store. Blair's been rudely bumped into the sidelines by Princess Di. So, John, on the speech itself, how is it that every newspaper from Down Market, Tabloids to Broadsheet has effectively gone for the same line? But that was the little uh, surprise he had up his sleeve, really, the ditching of Clause 4, uh, rewriting the party constitution, which came right at the end of the speech. Much of Blair's thinking is conveyed to the press by Labour's former press director, now MP, Peter Mandelson, and 24-year-old newspin doctor, Tim Allen. What role do his mind do, the spin doctors play? Well, they, um, and they did a very good job yesterday in keeping this line about the, the ditching of Clause 4 secret. Nobody had a sniff of it the day before. And uh, despite the fact that all of us have been prowling the corridors and uh, bars of, of Blackpool for the, since the weekend, it was kept very cleverly under wraps. Conference is over for the day, and it's time for the delegates and journalists to relax again, each in their own ways. They take over hotels and pubs in the town. At the Clifton, Rick is chairing an old-style fringe meeting calling for justice for miners. The hard-left stalwarts, Scargill, Skinner and Ben are his speakers. Ironically, the News of the World, owned by the left's favourite hate figure, Rupert Murdoch, is holding its party in the same hotel. Will Rick be going? And most certainly not. No. Why not? Because I don't want anything to do with anything that's got the remotest connection with Rupert. We went downstairs to see how many Labour MPs had accepted the new hand of friendship of the News of the World, but the paper weren't very keen to let us find out. Hello, yes, we're from uh, ITV's Big Story. We just wondered if we could do a bit of... Uh, no, I'm sorry. We have not asked everybody to come. Oh, right, I see. It's a private pub. Right. So, can, can you just go out? Okay. I'm sure everyone is delighted to welcome Dennis Skinner. Upstairs, they're giving a warning to Tony Blair about trusting his new admirers. And the Tory press, who have praised him to the hilt this morning, will be on his back every single day. And sure enough, this morning, the sun returned to form with an article designed to embarrass Mr Blair. New friends can be so untrustworthy. Comrades, let's be tough on capitalism and tough on the causes of capitalism. 
and old friends have a way of coming back to haunt you. This morning, the left won a vote supporting Clause 4 of the Constitution, an embarrassment for Blair. Let's do more than sing about it. Let's do it. Raise the scarlet standard high and keep the red flag flying here. I move Palmerside 57. New friends or old, they can all cause trouble at a party. The Big Story returns at the same time next Thursday.